Okay, thank you for coming. Uh, so today, uh, we have uh, Brian Frey and Chris Warren. Uh, so I would say they are the ones who are probably most centric to our school of emerging practices. Um, uh, so Graham uh, founded his own practice, Fairy Year Architecture Studio, in 2010. And Chris, around the same time, uh, his office, uh, as more, uh, in 2009. Uh, they both have been through offices around the same time. Uh, Chris was there between 2000 and 2006. Uh, Graham was there between 2002 and 2010, which, looking back, I think it was a pretty, uh, probably a transitional period for offices when, um, during the time, Tom Main won the Pritzker Award in 2005, and I would say the firm, I think, had just finished uh, Caltrans, and they were getting more and more larger scale institutional um, buildings uh, where, you know, where they were starting to actually build a lot. And um, you know, Chris and Graham both were in the core of the team, um, you know, leading design to execution of those larger scale um, uh, institutional and other type of urban uh, buildings. So I think they would be very curious to hear how that experience translates into their now their own individual practice, which by nature is um, the scale of the office is smaller, but you know they're capable of designing uh, anywhere between you know, super small scale to, to super large scale. So I, I, you know, I think I'm personally curious to hear how that uh, earlier experience translates and how they are different or similarities between the two. So with that, um, just a couple of practical things. This is uh, we are um, a continuing education provider and this is the course description to Chris. Okay, so um, yeah, today I hope to get to some of the things that I guess we should talk about. I think um, I can probably speak for Graham and myself, where even after what, seven or eight years of practicing on our own, we're still trying to figure out where our detachment is from that former office and um, where our director is. Um, so maybe keep it pretty casual today and just kind of run through some, some thoughts. This is actually the first time I've had to kind of clarify, I guess, my thinking about um, what it means to come from a, such an established office and you know, just on your own and how that actually affects the work. Um, so a lot of the things I'm going through, I wasn't even really cognizant of until I started putting this lecture together. Um, so this will be a, a good, as good an experience for me as this review, hopefully. Um, so one thing I want to address first is I always get asked this is why is the name of your firm Word? And what does it mean? Um, so, naming an office once you get out of school is actually a really aggravating task. It takes a lot longer than you think. It's, uh, it's kind of made harder by the advent of Google and the internet, um, because basically whenever you're starting to look for your office name, you're trying to find what URL doesn't already exist. So Word, unfortunately, exists in like many, many forms. Um, so then you start thinking, well, I'll Google my name and see what comes up. So I'll Google Chris, Chris Warren just to see uh, you know, what's going to happen. So if you Google Chris Warren, you basically, oops. Oh, that's funny, it's not changing on the screen. So you Google Chris Warren, and this comes up. None of these are me. You get a pro, uh, pro running back. You get a heartthrob actor that was in High School Musical and you get some other man named Chris Warren. Um, so differentiating yourself just by having a name as the authorship of a firm is a little tough in my case. I think for Graham Ferrier, it's probably a little bit easier. Um, and then, so to take it farther, I said, well, what if I do my, what my mother calls me, which is Christopher Warren. And if you do that, you get this guy, Warren Christopher, who's the Secretary of State under Clinton. Uh, he has thousands and thousands of posts and image searches, so that wasn't gonna help. Um, so I started thinking about where we came from, and that's uh, morphosis. Um, it's the original intent of this term, which apparently is a Latin term to mean something like being in formation or to be formed. Um, 
is really meant to take authorship out of the picture and actually release the individual from having any grand statement over the practice. Um, and in, in Tom Wayne's case, it's meant to really uh, put forth a collaborative nature of what he thinks the design process and office should be. Um, you know, I, I completely agree with that. Graham and I fully uh, were on board with uh, that type of thinking. But then you start to find out, and we found out even while we were there, for instance, uh, if you win the Pritzker, like Tom Maine did, it's suddenly hard to say morphosis won the Pritzker because they always want to address the individual. So the media wants to address the individual, clients want to address the individual, they don't necessarily just want to say, oh, I'm working with you know, Toyota, they want to say I'm working with Mr. Toyota. So um, I think a lot of other firms kind of took that into account. Um, Although you still have, obviously, like Stephen Hall Architects, Saha, uh, the Architects, uh, these people who are very well known. Um, and they can kind of carry the authorship labels because that's what, that's what their firm is about, and that's kind of the way that their firms came, came around. Um, so, in looking at this further, you know, you realize that there have been uh, name recognition firms that started to go into these abbreviations like Stephen Lawrence and Merrill, uh, VR Ingalls Group. Shop is Sharples and Pasquarelli, um, Rex Moss, Stowell. So in those cases on the top, they actually address the names of the people involved, but they shorten it to something memorable that seems to kind of alienate it. So you know it could still be collaborative, but then in the case of you and Gar Engels group, it doesn't say architecture, it doesn't say design, it just sounds like it could be an incorporation, right? And then if you have on the bottom OMA, FOA, Office for Metropolitan Architecture, Foreign Office Architects, to tell you what they do, but then there's no authorship and no individuals kind of um, aligned with it. So based on this, I wanted to do something catchy, yet get the name in there, just in case, you know, one of these days there's a reason for me to uh, be recognized by some by something or by someone. Um, so that's when we're came about. So once you figure that out, you start doing all the paperwork, you file all your forms with the state, and then you totally forget to Google it and see what happens. So when you Google Word, unfortunately, this is the first thing that comes up. And you get about 5,000 images of this logo or you know, Windows 95 logo of Word. Um, and then you also get uh, the Word of God, which, um, I kind of like, I mean, I think that's kind of catchy. And actually, when, when I did put the name together, I started thinking about things like the word and how you know we could kind of play into that. I also like word as just a noun and being a building block of language um, and how that could translate to architecture. Um, the other problem, though, is that if you, if, you, if you Google word architecture, you just get a bunch of definitions of the word architecture. So you, it's impossible to find me unless you know the abbreviations of, of what it stands for or if you know my name. So if you Google Warren Office, you can find me. If you Google Chris Warren Architect, you can find me maybe if you scroll down half a page or so. Um, the, uh, and one unfortunate other thing is when you start telling people what the name means, <laughs> who they should write a check to, how you address the contract, um, suddenly it's, okay, Warren Office for Research and Design. Okay, I started the firm before I was licensed, so it doesn't say architecture in there because you're not allowed to say architecture, but then you establish yourself and you don't want to change your name. So do I append it with Warren Office for Research and Design plus architecture? That's been an ongoing question. Um, usually people just refer to us as Warren Office. It's the easy way. My wife refers it. She thinks Warren is silly. Um, Warren Office Architects works. I have so many, you know, contracts that are signed just in Chris Warren's when firms not even uh, named. And then in rare cases, uh, when I was teaching at USC, I was actually given a check. I was leaving for study abroad for a month to go to Rome, and I had a stipend check for thousands of dollars to come here while I was there. And they addressed it to Warren Teckington, who was another teacher at, um, at USC. So we often get uh, mistaken for one another. He actually happens to look a little bit like me, and we teach at the same place. He's about 6'4". Um, he hangs out with famous people. Um, but so it's, this is just to say that, uh, you know, it's kind of, and it comes, all, comes back to being part of a, a woman office. Like, how did you establish your identity? 
So not only is it a name, this is kind of a cheeky way to, to go about talking about this, but um, you know, not only is it in the name, but it's also in the work, and then how do you start actually separating yourself from the work? Oh, and unfortunately, as I said, Graham Ferrier, my, my colleague, uh, you would think he'd be safe from this, but unfortunately there's a really famous French architect named Jacques Ferrier with the same spelling, so even he's run into this problem. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, to get back to the morphosis, um, you know, there are a few things that I was really intrigued by when I worked there, and I don't know if it's that I was affected by the office when I was there, or if that we shared similarities, which is what drew me to the office. I think it's a little bit of both. But um, one thing to illustrate this is Tom absolutely loves Jim Dine, and this painting in particular. Um, and it's just the disembodiment of the figure and just the uh, remnants of the, of the clothing and the robe left over. Uh, if you look at his architecture, you can see this um, coming through in many things from how he kind of drapes skins over buildings and how there's the form created the around the form. They don't always necessarily relate. Uh, so I was really taken by this idea. And, um, but I think as I've come out, I've actually gravitated, I kept this as a, as a staple, but then gravitated towards something a little more modern. So these are sculptures by Anthony Gormley. Um, it's the same premise. It's talking about the figure, but in this case, it's like the, uh, I guess, the etherealization or the, uh, uh, you know, kind of the, the figure without actually any form or any existence. It's the implication of the figure. Um, and this, I think, is slowly coming into play in my work. It's taking a long time to realize it, uh, but it's something that I'd like to kind of move on uh, moving forward, or we're not moving forward. So this is Cooper Union. Um, this is a project I have a hand in, not a, not a big hand, but I did have a hand in it. Uh, this is again kind of referencing the Jim Dine photo, where you have this robe or a skin about the body. Um, the nice thing about it is that it has this ethereal nature, whereas in the day it looks absolutely solid because it's perforated metal. So you see the reflection of the metal. And then at night, you actually see the body behind kind of coming through. Um, and I think, you know, Tom works with uh, effects of what skins can do and, and how they uh, inform spatial, I guess, awareness. Uh, and that's something I'd like to pursue, or I'm trying to pursue. So this is actually another work by Anthony Gormley, which is, uh, I guess, like the, the D, I don't know, how do you say, dematerialization of space, right? So it's creating space actually changing the physical state of the space. In this case, it's just a fog or like a mist. Um, and I just find this really interesting, and there's a project that I'll, I'll show kind of late in the lecture that kind of touches back on this effect. Um, and I think effect is, is something that I'm trying to get into more and more, whereas the morphosis is really it's surprising how pragmatic the office was um, and how little it was about these other I guess less tangible things like effect and more about uh, creating meaning spaces. So that's definitely something that we did. Um, I'd say it was uh, more of a habit thing and less of a, um, I guess, ethereal, something that's ethereal in nature. Uh, we were going through a few projects that we actually touched while I was there. So this is the very first thing I worked on. Um, I think this is one of the first 3D printed architectural models to be used in a competition uh, ever. So this was back in 2001, in early 2009. We had one of the first 3D printers that anyone had heard of. I don't think Frank Gehry had one. I don't think anyone else in LA had one. Tom was always a very forward-thinking person as far as technology goes. Um, that's me in the star t-shirt in the back. And this thing, it was incredible that it stayed together. We did not know what we were doing, and the model was in three pieces, or two pieces, and it was actually about this big. And to do that for a first test case for a printed model, pretty much in at least West Coast architectural history, was something that we were really excited about. Um, but the, the reason I chose this is that I'm always really interested in kind of the unification of a section in a design, and you know, everything that's going on in here was designed by us, and it was, um, we always look at buildings sectionally because we believe that they tell the biggest story when it comes to space 
and ex experiencing the space. So planning can, obviously if a section in conjunction with a plan can do a lot, but if you're looking at one or the other, I'm always a believer the section is the kind of the way to go. Um, this is one project that I had a really heavy hand in. It's a little known project for whatever reason, um, a social housing in Madrid. And I really appreciate this moving forward just because of the sheer kind of roughness of it. I mean, the budget of this was less than you can build a house for in Los Angeles by, by hundreds of, you know, $100 per square foot less. This was social housing, it was built on a shoestring budget. Um, and, you know, it has real idiosyncrasies as far as like what's happening with the skin and how everything's delaminating. And things can actually be made out of pieces and then actually expressed in pieces. Uh, things don't always have to be a smooth, sinuous form. Um, and that's something that I would like to kind of try and bring back. It's not really showing up in the work yet. Um, but it seems like for the last 10 or so years, everything has to be an easily readable form, like, you know, an object viewed from the outside, whereas this is just a collection of thousands and thousands of pieces of building material uh, to form what is a pretty nice space. As far as social housing goes, I think, you know, the, having this as your courtyard and your social housing is, is pretty nice. Okay, so this is also one of the first projects I worked on, and this is the NOAA Satellite Operations Facility outside of DC. Um, the reason that I'm continually drawn back to this is that it's really talking about how architecture can integrate landform. So, oops, if you see in the section, there's actually a huge uh, grass roof. Um, I can't remember, it's like 350 or 400 feet in diameter. Um, it's actually the top, if you're in Rhino, you make a huge sphere, like a, a kilometer in, in radius or diameter, and you just cut off the top, that's exactly how we model this in kind of uh, in more dated software. But then the entire operations facility is, and scientists and engineers are actually under this green roof. It reveals itself at certain points, but from the other side towards the residential area, you see nothing but a green hill. Um, and then all the extremely technical, you know, satellite facilities and uh, launch operations are kind of in this box that hovers over. Again, I like this because it's really rough. It's almost like an infrastructural project. Um, it doesn't shy away from not hiding, you know, messy details of galvanized steel and having big landing walkways kind of just hanging down out of nowhere because it actually addresses an issue and addresses the use um, without worrying so much about form or the implications of form. This is a, um, a park that we did in, um, I think Chandler Aarons used to teach here. So Chandler and I worked on this project together. It was a kilometer long park in Pudong uh, in one half of Shanghai. Um, and it was a science museum slash convention center slash art museum, you know, kind of everything you can think of under the sun. Um, but what you begin to realize is, sure, these look like buildings right now, Actually, under all of these little domes are, are more programs that are kind of embedding themselves in nature. So you begin with actual nature and landscape on the side, and as you move towards the city, you get more and more into the urban realm. It's a smooth transition. So this idea of integrating nature kind of seamlessly in architecture is something that I'm really fond of. Um, and then we come to really large scale work. And one thing I'm hoping to get across today is that in my mind, there's no difference in your design process when it comes to something that's extremely large scale versus something that is as small um, as a piece of furniture. You have the same mentality, the same design philosophy going into it. Um, it. It may seem more complex in the beginning, but when you break down the bits and pieces and actually think about how you address space, how you address the pedestrian or the, the occupant, it, it really is, um, should not be that daunting. And I think I move into our work after this slide. So, oh, I should say, so this is Manhattan. This is a cross section of Manhattan. The UN is like right here, right here. Um, Roosevelt Island would be up here. This is the New Jersey shore. And our project is this monstrous thing. I think it was about 53 acres of development, had 4,500 housing units. This was for the Olympic Village for New York um, proposal, which we won, and which 
uh, was subsequently not awarded as the United States, going to London. So this project was a winning competition project that ended up never being anything. Um, but it was, it was nice in the idea that we had 4,500 housing units in the 53-acre site, and we were giving at least 46 acres of parkland back to the community. So by adding increasing density in housing, increasing, uh, increasing density of use, being smart about how you uh, transport yourself through the site, you could actually you know, give a big bonus back to the community. Um, so jump forward a few years, I started teaching at USC, kind of um, began practicing with another partner, and um, you know, we hit the economic decline, so that partnership ended. And this is one of the first projects I worked on as a sole proprietor after the fact. Um, this is a 25 kilometer long site that we had to make a master plan for. The master plan was 320 million square feet of development, of actual building. Um, and I did this with four interns in two weeks. So to say that it's not, you know, I can say it's not daunting, it truly isn't because we finished this in two weeks and we're a ranch chapel group. Um, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of a proof to that fact. But what it was, was we worked with SWA Landscape Architects um, which we actually worked with in uh, the design of this project um, to design uh, new housing. I can't remember how many hundreds of thousands of inhabitants we had, I think it was 500,000 or so, um, to do neighborhoods down to uh, urban scape, down to a kind of a university atmosphere, to more like leisurely housing, uh, vacation rentals, and then kind of suburban, you know, um, I think a second home type developments around lakes down here. Uh, the whole thing was based off of using um, water filtration and cleaning the uh, what was currently very polluted uh, coal mining water and running it through a natural process oops, from the mountains on the side of the site and jet, slowly beginning it to filter so that by the time it gets to these areas, it's actually usable, swimmable, potable. Um, so it was. It was, uh, I guess, master planning, not built just to meet square footage, but to actually accomplish something kind of environmentally, uh, environmentally uh, sustainable. Um, Keely, who's lecturing next week, sitting back there, actually did these renderings for us in like a day, <laughs> back in time. Um, this is the urban portion of that master plan we're talking about. So you can see where 320 million square feet of, of development starts to come in. But really simply, we just took the idea of, okay, in the urban area, we're going to use the urban scape to mimic land mass. So you see where, uh, like here for instance, we're actually carving hills and valleys out of things. Of course we have, you know, typical development as we needed to. Uh, there was no waterway here, so that was all designed to kind of influence the area and um, you know have the, the living atmosphere for this new city um, can be something unique. And then conversely, if he goes down south, uh, farther south in the master plan, we start having landscape mimicking building forms, so it's kind of the reversal. So just like that Pudon Park, where you want to uh, transition smoothly from landscape to the urban scape. We're kind of doing this reversal of what's urban and what's landform. Um, and for you know 25 25 kilometer long site, we we produce these two renderings and then about 100 diagrams um, and and plans. So I mean, we actually had plans of the whole thing. So uh, this is that kind of urban core. You can see the different, I guess, figure ground if you want to call it that, of that versus where we get to more of this university built around the agro. Um, agro ed education facility um, and just how it integrates with the water, etc. So, with my the things aren't chronological here, so I'm jumping a little back and forth. But um, what you'll see is I'm actually starting at the larger scale and I'm going to end at the smallest scale. Um, this was when I had a partner in an interim between Word and Morphosis. And that was Mario Cipresso and our office was called Studio Shift. Um, in this case, it was a competition entry for a CEC in Taiwan, and we actually were a finalist. Um, flew to Taiwan to present the project. We were one of six finalists worldwide. Uh, worked with the lab, lab designer 
Um, this is in 2008 or 2000, yeah, 2008, I believe. Um, the project, unfortunately, was never built. Uh, we did, I guess, we received an honorable mention for it. Um, but again, this goes back to the NOAA project and how you can have a landform building. So the, you can tell that this is building. It's it's kind of discreet from the landform. It's not meant to feel like it's just rising up out of uh, the earth. Um, but at the same time, it becomes an amenity. We have a jogging track on top. Um, so we've got a jogging track on top. We created a really nice entryway. Um, and you know, just the spatial organization of this is something you find that we found working in our former offices. Um, it's something you see in school projects. So you basically take all of this in, and, and this was the result in this case. Uh, we're obviously still dealing with the idea of skin. So this is more of the gym dying skin, where you have a, you know, a fabric basically enveloping the body. It's a little loose from the actual structure itself. Uh, to give a different reading rather than being so um, such kind of a one-to-one -one reading. Um, and this is just a this really huge model that I love showing because I was happy with it. Unfortunately, it remained in Taiwan, so I'll never see it again. And then to the diagram, um, something that we always believed was a really strong tool in explaining projects. I think amorphosis and animal practice uh, would differ from someone like Gar Ingalls, whereas we're not diagramming an actual design process. Um, I for one don't think that a true design process is simplified enough to be diagrammed in the way that they're showing it. Um, and that offices like that are kind of pulling one, pulling the wool over your eyes and just using it as a sales tool because architecture and spatial development is inherently complex. Um, whether you're coming down to designing a bathroom or you're doing something the size of this, uh, you know, to say that it can be dumbed down to a series of five operations that you can show on cons uh, consequential slides yeah, is really something I don't agree with. Um, but instead, we use the diagram to explain what's going on. So to take a really complex project and try and simplify it so that a lay person can actually read and understand what's happening inside the building within the 15 minutes you have to present them. And we also like really working on the tectonics of something, even though it's uh, just a competition entry. You know, we work with structural engineers, mechanical engineers, um, even people who develop building skins to at least put forth as realistic of a proposal as possible. Um, this was a project proposal for development again in China for Mi Yi Tower. This was with SWA. We did a, uh, we did a master plan for the entire area, which again was a new city. These were it was really big back then. New cities were popping up everywhere. Just you would get asked by the government to design a city for a million people, and you have four weeks to do so, which is really insane if you think about it. Um, but this was just a focal point of the design, which was an iconic tower. In this case. Um, what you can't really notice is that these are program boxes that have open space above each one. And in essence, it's an attempt to bring um, parkland, which will be over here, kind of up through the building so this becomes a completely public um, amenity. It's not meant to be like a waving arm, although it kind of looks like it. Um, it won a competition, so I guess they liked that kind of thing. But, and then, you know, we, so one thing we like to do is if we render these with enough detail, you know, you show this as a, as a, uh, the overall, and then you get a vignette in here of you know, what the space could actually be like. Um, we started to get in a little bit from the skin here, and it's more of, in this case, it's used more of, uh, I guess, an effect, you know, creating the shadow pattern on the building, giving you something that's, that's changing all day long. Um, and it's really here, it's not performative at all, it's just covering structure. So this was more, uh, something to, I guess, give it the, the little kick that it needed. Um, okay, so then pull back. We had, Mario and I had an office for a few years, and then Morphosis gets really busy. They get offered to do a competition in Kuala Lumpur. They don't have a manpower for it, so they pulled Mario and myself in as 50-50 partners to do a competition smell. Um, it's really uncommon. I don't think they've done it. I don't think they did it before or since. Um, but this was the resultant of that. This was a tower in Kuala Lumpur. Um, Q 
can't remember what happened with this one. There was, oh, happened right at the economic downturn. So they had a competition. Um, we submitted all the boards, made a model, shipped the model there. Once they received all of the items, they canceled the competition. Um, subsequently, three years later, when the economy got a little bit better, they decided not to look at the competition entries, but to just award it to Ole Sheeran for whatever reason. So um, one thing you have to deal with in, in architecture, having your own practice, or even having a huge practice like Tom's, is heart rate, uh, because it happens more often than not, because uh, we really love this one. So this is a thing, um, competition in Korea for the National Museum of Writing in Carmelia, and I just worked on um, over the summer. And it was say we did not win this either, but again, you can see little bits and pieces of you know things showing up that have happened in my past parts of my experience that are kind of popping up. Uh, at the time, I didn't even realize this was happening until we printed the boards and started looking at things, and I'm saying, oh, that looks like one of the first projects that I had worked on. How strange. Um, uh, here's an interior uh, interior rendering. The one thing that's that I think is different in this case is that in the interior space, whereas you know, Morris's, uh, even my work with Studio Shift and Mario, was a little more, I guess, idiosyncratic or um, you know, rougher, it wasn't a cohesive space. In this case, we tried to do just one really nice cohesive space because it was a museum lobby um, and called for that. So we dealt with smoothing of surfaces, which is something we don't, you know, don't always do. And then back to the diagram, of course, to explain the, explain our thinking behind the ideas. And then you can just see the poche and how, uh, how this building actually engages land masses here. Oops. Um, oh, again, you know, back to the section, like in the Rensselaer model, I'm still, you know, I'll say it now and, and moving forward, the, the section to us is the most important. We don't necessarily know that this is what is going to happen when we're designing the project because everything we do is in 3D. Um, but because of the operations that we employ, we're almost always guaranteed to have a, an interesting section, interesting, of in course. Um, you know, we didn't think that this building was as, as close to this one as it was, but it's actually very similar. There's actually a competition that we both worked on um, the year before. This was more. Uh, Whereas the last one was more of an idea of this atrium kind of pulling up from the, from the ground. This one was based on a block um, that's, that's completely rectangular, uh, so that contextually it deals with all sides exactly the same. And then it just gets eroded out by whatever's happening kind of on the lower level of the city and where we need views or where we need to have a protected tree. This was for a museum in a museum of the 20th century uh, in Berlin competition, which here's all going to be on subsequently won. Um, and then you find these the kind of little oddballs, the outliers, and this was a project that uh, we did partnering with a, um, an old grad school friend of mine um, in Berkeley for the Guggenheim entry. The competition only had 2,000 or 1,500 you know, <laughs> entries. Uh, like the Korean one I just showed, I think there were 130 entries. And this one we're dealing with 15 or 1,600 entries. Um, you have to wonder if they even saw it, you know, in the end. Um, but this was kind of a departure for us, but it's something I think that's going to kind of keep this in the wheelhouse because I find parts of it, bits and pieces of it, really interesting. Again, we had a rendering that's pulled farther out, and then we do these little vignettes where you zoom in because you'll never know, you know. You don't plan for it when you zoom into an image. You can often find these little moments that you're really happy with, such as this and this. Um, just just for the sake of knowing, this was actually all uh, laminated timber structure that was draped over structural systems, so that the entire roof of this thing was like draped kind of um, timber in tension. And this roof actually became a landscape roof that connected with a bridge to the, or via the bridge to the park. Um, and we still look at, you know, ideas of tectonics, um, solar gain, perforation, and how all that matches with a, a grid structural system to the actual um, cladding of the roof and then the glass and how the glass is even treated differently, whether it's shaded, translucent, clear, etc. Um, 
me kind of run through these. So we're getting smaller and smaller in scale. Uh, this is a house that in China, outside of Beijing. Um, that had to deal with a it's kind of stacked, like you, know, you guys know the refill chair, and the refill joint, which is just through the three axes kind of butted up against one another. Um, this house was completely based on that. You kind of see vertical X, Y. Um, and then I always, you know, I don't know why, I still like what I call, or what we call idiosyncrasies. Like it's very simple to just come out with a diagram, and make the form, have the form smoothed out so it looks nice. But then I'm never happy with it unless we add like a little something that you wouldn't expect on it. So this is a little cantilever like studio, um, which would work. The structure actually cantilever is this way and cantilever is up, so it's supported. Um, and then we're moving in here into different ideas of how to, uh, I guess, show show the work. You know, whatever you present doesn't always have to be detailed, doesn't always have to be photorealistic. Um, you can kind of get the ideas across by much simpler means in many cases. Um, yeah, so she put this on Instagram, so I thought I'd show up. I wasn't going to show it, but it's just a little Holocaust memorial we did for New Jersey. Um, and this it was a really simple idea of plate tectonics and how you could build something completely out of plate steel um, and make a pretty powerful statement. It's based on just a triangulated structural system that touches down on the ground in some cases and then not in cameras and others. And I'll show, I'll get to a little detail of that later. Um, it's a house we recently finished in Mar Vista. Here, it's hard to tell from these photos, but the, we're just really looking at simple changes in materiality. Here we have standing seat metal, whereas here we have metal with gaps between the panels. So you're kind of inverting, you know, the nature of the uh, texture of that. Um, you can see it a little better when it comes into the sun, but yeah, it's pretty straightforward developer projects so we try and get as much you know research as we can out of these things and looking into materiality such as uh, this wood slab which you'll see in a minute. So as an architect going on your own, you and I'm sure Graham's gonna address this, but we were working on projects with million, tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars in the budget. And once you start on your own, you essentially drop down to doing like kitchen remodel is your first thing. Um, you're designing everything with structural steel because you don't know how to do anything else, even though it's uh, a tie fire residential building. <laughs> you don't know how to go through plan check, so you walk in there and you expect to be catered to because you're this great architect who worked for a Pritzker Prize winner and they could care less. Um, they just want to make sure you have all the safety requirements. Um, but so that said, one way that I'm finding to the at least keeps the office going a little bit. And is, and is interesting and used as a, a learning tool on our end is um, actually helping foreign companies come into the Los Angeles market. So this is for APC, this is their flagship store on Melrose Ave, uh, sorry, Melrose Place. They have a designer in Paris who's done 45 or 50 of their stores. Of course, they're not going to suddenly hire me to do the design. However, they need a, an architect in the United States or in California in particular um, to get a design for planning, to talk, you know, to find consultants here, to get everything permitted, to talk to the contractors on a daily basis and figure out details that are, you know, things that are built completely differently in Europe than they are here. Um, so we're very picky as to who we work with on these because we don't, we don't, in essence, it's not what we're here to do. We're here to be design architects, um, speaking for myself and Carmelia. Um, however, these are really nice as a learning tool uh, especially when you're young, to kind of get these across. So this was just a, an old existing furniture uh, store that we converted into men's and women's fashion. Um, this entire cut was not there when we began. So even though it's a 2,500 square foot store, we have a, a 20 inch by 18 inch steel tube that's 40 feet long. It's actually holding this whole building up. And then these columns don't support any gravity load, they're only for lateral load. So you get a set, essentially you can take these out, the building's gonna remain exactly where it is until an earthquake hits. Um, there are no columns in the store, so this, this beam is actually resting on two, two other beams going side to side here and here. Um, so we really took a 2,500 square foot building, chopped out the entire first story, and levitated the whole mass. Um, no one will know that except us and you, because there's a customer walking in there, you know, you just don't recognize those things. Um, there's an interior. 
And then, you know, again, as we pull down the scale, we start putting the, the attention to detail that we would put in a really large building, looking at, you know, tens of thousands of square feet in skin, and then putting that same effort and emphasis into something as small as a fitting room. So in this case, we're just looking at all white oak. Um, you know, we still have a little bit of fun. What you don't see is this is a, a skylight where the glass is actually pitched, and I think it's about 14 feet by 10 feet, and where the glass connects to the pitch, there's no volume. It's actually self-supporting, um, so it's completely frameless. Um, you know, so, you know, to me, I love that kind of stuff. I like geek out on details like that. Um, again, it's not something anyone's going to recognize unless, since I told you, you can go to the store or go in the fitting room and say, oh, it's really hot in here. Why don't they put something over this guy? <laughs> <laughs> Which we did. We have a camouflage over, camouflage netting over this now. Um, and then you get to still, you know, play with the skin and this wood slat thing is a theme that this shows up a few times in the slides to come. Um, another, you see sort of this one's in Silver Lake, again, same, similar kind of motif. Uh, this is an unbuilt house in, in off of Mulholland. Um, it's funny because people often think that because I work on this facade, that this wood slat thing is something that I'm just taking from the store and bringing forth and et cetera, et cetera. But, I mean, we've been doing it for a long time. We're not, obviously, we're not the ones that, that do it. It's basically my excuse for, it's a cheap man's version of perforated metal, right? You can get a similar kind of, like, delaminating, um, translucent effect with uh, wood slats, you know, from a certain distance, as you actually can with uh, much more expensive material. Um, and here we're actually completely taking it off of the face of the building and using it just as a screening element, but rather than connecting back to the face of the building, it's um, kind of cantilevering itself out away from it. And we like this idea of layering and delamination. Again, I guess taking this, this the row or whatever it may be, and actually giving myself 40 minutes, so I'm pretty much on track. Um, and just trying to bring it away from the body of the building, so it's actually a separate, a separate entity. Um, so this was on the point, never got built. Uh, I was talking about think a little about this earlier. Um, again, a pretty rationalized facade on this, and then even though it's rationalized, I, we just feel the need to throw these little idiosyncratic moments out of it. It's more of like a playful element to kind of keep us happy and in doing these projects can take a lot of time and a lot of effort, a lot of not arguing with the client, but we'll say back and forth. So at least we keep ourselves entertained and interested in these things, and this is kind of one way to go about it. Um, and then I, I have a client, I'm not showing any of the work from the project, but uh, he's an artist and actually did this, so you know you start kind of throwing one thing from one project into another project, because for you, to look back in, in 10 years and say, oh, it's funny that we did that, but uh, no one else will ever know. Um, okay, wood slats, <laughs> cheap perf. Um, this is in Glendale. You guys should totally go. It's on Sonora and Flower. It's like right off of the western exit. Um, we, my client owns a, a restaurant in South Pasadena, and he wanted to get into the coffee business, so he found this little tiny shack. I should have I should have shown you a before picture because it's like atrocious. You would think it's just you know, fit for complete demolition. Um, but we actually remodeled it, added onto it, and somehow we got grandfathered into having a walk-up counter service. So you can just walk up to the cafe, there's no interior seating. And we built this, uh, an outdoor seating area. Um, there is absolutely nothing in this, in this vicinity uh, for the pedestrians. There's a, a neighborhood about a five, well, 10 minute walk away, and then the rest of the street is really, um, uh, animation studios. So it's these campuses, a thousand people will drive in in the morning, they have Starbucks in their campus, they have all the catering they need, they've never set foot outside, and then they drive out at night. But some of them are really, really wanting some other amenities in the area, you know, they just have to get out of there for lunch. Um, so you can drop this on a corner about a block away from some of these studios, it's going really well. Um, and again, here, we're using hard elements like the casting place concrete wall in the lower portion because we're on a really busy corner. There's a lot of noise and pollution involved. There's even you know a bit of a security aspect involved. And then we're shading, shading the space and making it more intimate. So you're closed in, but you can still see through the screen, um, which 
you know, gives you kind of a nice feel. So suddenly when you're inside, it feels like a little garden. He's slowly adding plantings, um, trying to convince him to just blow out a hole in the concrete and grow a tree in here. Um, and in this case, you know, what made it fun for us is instead of just doing a normal wood slab building, and this was this was being designed before the APC store, I just like to say. Um, <laughs> Which I think is why they chose us, because hey, we're already dealing with wood, so of course we should work together. Um, but you know, the detailing of this, the sizing of this, uh, the specification is different than this, is different than this, is different than that. Even in the awning, you know, you can see the size and the spacing and the connection details of just this piece, you know, this piece of awning is different than the one next to it. That turns out the facade, everything's supported on these steel posts that are kind of kindly bring out. So, I think this is 600 square feet, you can still get really involved and, you know, get something that you can get your hands pretty quick. Um, and then, you know, everything, when you're dealing with these kind of diaphanous systems, you get really nice effects of light and shadow, so this kind of starts to remind me of that, um, the tower that we did where I showed you the zoomed in photo where the shadows falling on the concrete. Um, and this is a fact, an effect that we're kind of always looking for. Um, and then the last project, is a jewelry store that we just finished in Rowe, downtown LA. So it's in the arts district in this new development called Rowe. Not called the Rowe, they hate it when I say the Rowe, it's called Rowe. Um, it's near uh, Alameda and it's in this huge industrial complex, hundreds of thousands, if not a million square feet, I think three stories, um, where they gutted everything into these beautiful concrete buildings and then they're making it a retail destination. So you have to drive there. You drive in, there's like a 10 story parking structure, which right now I've only ever seen maybe 20 cars in the entire thing because the stores aren't filling in yet. We're one of the first stores there. Um, and then you have this destination uh, shopping street that is within this old industrial relic. It's kind of really interesting. I hope it does well. Um, in this case, we're dealing with a really, really low budget. Uh, I don't think, I don't know if you guys are familiar with it. They were like $135 a square foot on this with completely new electrical and, and everything. Um, and this again is just, uh, I guess, uh, you know, doing as much with as little as possible and then using two really simple forms, which is an, an arch or semicircle in plan with an arch that's intersecting it on the side. And that's other than casework and a few plants in the front, that's really all there is to this. Um, it turned out beautifully, they love it, uh, their clients love it. Um, we're hoping to get, you know, do more of these types of, of things. I never in my wildest dreams thought I would be like this luxury hip retail guy. And it's just not my thing. Like I wear t-shirts and shorts most of the time, you know, but um, and then Graham also speaks French. All of my clients are French, I don't speak any French, just like, it's, it's, it's weird how this kind of thing happens. Um, but yeah, so suddenly we're doing a lot of retail, um, fairly high end, you know, for really, but not, not like Chanel and things like that that have a world, world uh, recognition. This is kind of hip in the know brands. Um, and it's fun, I have to say, it keeps us kind of going. And, you know, this again, these really interesting moments that you don't plan when two geometries collide. It's kind of a more thing um, that, that, again, seeps, seeps through in the work. And here's the facade. So you're in this complex like that, and then you're going to have, I think, 120 stores of, you know, similar brands kind of lining the streets. And then the photographer we're working with now likes to take these little kind of vignette shots that don't really show the architecture, but are really nice for publishing purposes. Oh, that wasn't the last. All right, I'm really done in a few minutes. Um, <laughs> so to come full circle, this is a uh, this is actually my bathroom. <laughs> so, um, and when I showed the uh, the work with the fog coming out of the box in the beginning, and that was really a dematerialization or using you know changing the state of matter to, to get a different experience. I'm trying to do the same thing with materiality. Um, so this is the wall in the shower. But this and this is a reflection, so you're actually looking at your reflection that you get the sense of depth in a very, very small project. So we find that detailing things and material choices can really come a long way when you're, you know, when you're really looking for an effect that you wouldn't otherwise have in, in a typical space. 
So, and then it changes throughout the day, you know, when the light changes, it's, uh, that's really great. Okay, and then it even comes down to the design of furniture. So this was a custom-made sink that we designed, had fabricated, um, and uh, a chair. Again, this, I mean, it took so long to design this thing, it's so simple, because you're just putting the same effort into this. I took as long to do this as we did to do 320 million square feet of, of uh, master plan. Um, and the details, it's kind of something I've been talking about this whole time, but what I would like to say is since you guys are in school, you may not realize it now, but a lot of what you're learning now, the teachers that you have at this point in your, in your architectural career, your burgeoning architectural career, are actually subconsciously going to seep back into your work in the future. I didn't realize this until I really started looking back um, only recently through the work, but for instance at, at Penn, I had Alberto Campo Baeza as a teacher. So on one hand I worked with Tom, who was all about um, complexity and kind of showing off uh, and addressing and acknowledging that life and building and everything that we live amongst is a complex system. Campo Baeza on the other hand, I, I don't think you could draw a more simple section for such a beautiful house. Um, and to have these two kind of opposing viewpoints in an architectural career is something that I treasure. And I think this type of work, at, at some point it's beginning to, and I think at some point it's really going to, these two are going to melt together, at least I hope they do, because I think it could be something really interesting. I also had Brian Healy, who was a really good, um, really great influence. Um, and we're getting back to like simple vernacular architecture, the use of wood and, and materials that are kind of everyday materials and turning it into something new. These are a little dated, but uh, he's a really fantastic architect. And we have deal details such as in this, we just put a little hole in the steel plate system so that at night it lights up the top. So that's not a lighting effect of like shining the light on. That's actually coming from within. Um, again, we didn't necessarily know what it would look like this. We just experimented with the little things here and there, little details here and there that you wouldn't normally do. Uh, this is a project for residents. We're even addressing, uh, looking at ideas from artists like James Terrell. It's not exactly the sky space, but we're looking at the zero edge um, and kind of incorporating that detail. Again, we have the wood detailing. Um, you know, lighting is very important, especially if you're looking at small scale projects, it can kind of make or break your work. Um, there's a ceiling, uh, just a ceiling design for a little addition for the artist I mentioned earlier. Again, translucency and, and kind of wrapping of, of the form of the building. Uh, continuation of materials through um, inside to outside through transparency. Some more is a zero edge detail. Um, again, just little, you know, you always have these little things. Never, never think that because the project is small you can't get a lot of, out of it. It's basically what I'm saying. You can put as much effort into these as you do anything else. That's it. Thank you very much. So I have a big agenda today, <laughs> and I'm gonna I'm gonna do my best to move through it quickly and and, and make it you know relevant and, and something that you know, people find interesting. And what I is usually first asked uh, for me to speak of the emerging architects. I, I took it you know fairly seriously, and I thought to myself, what can I present that might be relevant to you? And of course, you know, it's always mentioned, you know, when I'm asked to speak is, is you know, morphosis and the background and, and where I've come from. And I want to take back a little bit further and talk about, you know, coming out of school, uh, moving into the profession and working and eventually working for yourself and, and, and where does it take you? And, and overall, I'm thinking about, you know, how can you carry, you know, how do you translate what may be your ideals as a designer, as an architect, and into the real world and how do you apply that? How do you Get paid. Who's going to So, 
When I went to school, it was in, in the 90s, um, we, we talked a lot. Uh, you know, we, we spent a lot of time uh, developing theory behind what we did. And, and I think, you know, what I was interested in, for the most part, in, in school was complexity. And what I could do to harness it and engage with it and, 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 and solve it to a certain extent. And when I was doing my own projects in school, you know, I had the luxury because of my background, because my, you know, back a little bit, my undergraduate degree is in urban planning. And I went into a master's degree, the first, first professional degree. And what I interested in, interested me was was how architecture and what, what place it had in, in the urban environment and how it integrated with that and how it dealt with the inherent complexities of, of life and how and how that would affect how you approached it. And and by the end of my my, my schooling and I'm not going to go into detail with this or something like that. But in, in a very, very simple way it was could you could you design as and think of what you design as a, as a result of, of of all the forces that were in play, and to not carry with you some sort of ideology. And, and to me, I I thought of ideology as being in a way like a style, um, but but more complex. And and thinking of, of if I can come to the to the table of, of this project or this design with any preconceived idea about how I want to do it or what I'm going to do. Can I do that? And, and if you think about why why you know people develop an ideology or a style, and, and in a lot of ways I think that is, is is a way to make the process easier, is to set yourself up with some preconceived ideas about how to solve the problems that you most likely are going to encounter. And does it make sense if you try to avoid that? Maybe not. But it's something I was interested in, something I wanted to try to do. And and, and out of through that discussion, I, I came to the idea of the idea of like a weak architecture, and the idea of an architecture that wasn't trying to stand out, was much more pliable, much more responsive, and in a way, leading itself to kind of almost be anonymous, and, and, and basically make it that what it wants to do is, 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 is support, and, and, to, and to blend seamlessly in the overall complex environment in order to, to you know, do its job, for lack of a better word. And then it led to just sort of an idea for me of architecture without qualities. And, and again, if you went to school in the 90s, you had to come up with terms that you know are controversial to some extent. Um, it's not to say that I wanted to do work that didn't have quality, but it was it was much more about that it, it wasn't striving to define itself by anything one thing in particular. And out of school, I you know I, I was. I was very smitten with this idea, and my advisor and, and my dean advised me at the time that probably a good place for me to go was Morphosis. Uh, Morphosis had just finished a project at the University of Toronto where I was at school, um, the graduate uh, housing building. And so the connections were there, uh, meetings were made, and I was lucky enough to land in Santa Monica. And immediately jumped into projects that were of the scale and complexity that I had been looking for. Um, I'm going to go through just a few, and mainly projects that uh, I have, you know, a reasonable hand in. The first project I had at Morphosis was the European Central Bank. It was a competition, you know, very large competition, very prestigious. You know, we worked with, uh, you know, we had all the engineers, we had consultants, we went to incredible detail, we designed structural systems, we had structural analysis, we, we use all this stuff to, to make the project be real. And we did this in a matter of weeks, as Chris was saying. Um, you can take these projects and, and really resolve them in almost no time at all. And, and it goes to this idea about at, at what scale does architecture change? In a lot of ways, it's very similar at all the scales. And from, from here, you know, at, at Morphosis, you have the luxury, at least in this time, uh, of working very directly with Tom and, and you know, very small teams. If, if, if only a team of one, which is very common. And you would, you would have the responsibility of moving from conception to pitch to doing clients and everything. And one of the projects I started with originally um, well, along the track was, uh, this is pre-crisis, was an incredibly dense project, development project, speculative development project in Miami, which went very quickly 
from uh, you know zero to insane density. Uh, and, and I show these slides really just to give an example of, of, of the kind of depth we took the analysis in trying to determine how these things would work. And again, as Chris was saying, the diagrams are not there to you know, present maybe a simplified narrative. They're there to try and make sense of the information. The data that we were dealing with was pretty intense. And how would you convey that in a short amount of time to the client? It's somewhat dense. And from there, we this is post Chris Prize, and a lot of projects came to the office that were you know, uh, grand in scale. And this was a project in Madrid, um, same city that uh, Chris's housing project was. And it was a you know a very large uh, mixed use project. Uh, that took over uh, a large part of the area in here, which is now the Atlantic Madrid Stadium, which is actually gone now. But uh, it was a large brewery and, and uh, stadium. And, and again, I, I'm not going to go into details of the, of the project itself, but suffice to say, it was urban and it was complex. We had to deal with the, the merging of all of these systems, all of the different types of programs, uh, deal with the, the river, uh, that they were sinking the, the M30 highway. And it was, you know, an incredibly uh, uh, rich set of, of, of uh, parameters to deal with and to, and to create a project out of. And this was a real project at the time. Uh, unfortunately, many projects to the scale didn't go anywhere. Now, at another point in my career there, my, the scale jumps down. And uh, I was in charge of uh, the Pompidou exhibit that Morpsis was doing. And we went through a very involved process of designing a building to go within the building. And it, we did it again, CATIA model, instructional engineers, uh, electrical, everything. And curation of all of the, of the Morpsis materials up to that point, uh, all the way down to the installation. Uh, the engineers uh, we worked with. Um, we all flew in and, and put the thing together ourselves. And it opened uh, you know, to great success, which we were all very happy about. Um, you know, one thing when you design something like this with uh, you know, a team of one and uh, I think about 200 sheets of laminated glass arrived, you hope they fit. And in the end, we were lucky and it worked out and it was a, it was a very interesting project. Thanks for the picture on the left, Chris. Now, around 2007, um, this is after the Pompidou, we won uh, a competition to do a tower in Paris and uh, I was a member of this team and ended up moving to Paris to work on it um, with my wife, Keely, who's here, she was my wife at the time, but became my wife in Paris. Uh, we worked on what may have been sort of the largest project that I worked on at that point, and perhaps the most complicated. You can see in the top left here, this was the site, and if you can identify the site, you're ahead of me, because it's basically right there. Um, it's at the the node of, of a passerelle between uh, Courbevoie and Paris. It's on top of a uh, highway, it's on top of the metro, it's on top of the RAR trains. Uh, it's interconnected with the buildings. It, it was incredible. And we had to con maintain large view corridors. And again, it was, it was something that everybody in Morpheus is really engaged with. It was what we, what we were there to do. And you know, reaching this point in my career and, and uh, working on a 74-story tower, uh, being responsible for um, the footprint of it, you know, the circulation, the cores, the, the roof, all of this, um, you know, was, a, was, a, was a, you know, a big moment. And unfortunately, the project didn't get built. Uh, we moved back to Los Angeles. And it came a point in one's career where you're deciding where you move next. And, you know, always that transition uh, out of you know the profession working for others into running your own is, is a bit blurry and 
it happens before you know it, in, in the sense of, you know, you may start a project before you're done your job, you may, you know, these things happen. But what happened with me is, is probably common to a lot of practitioners, is, is you move from, you know, 74 stories, tower, into basically a bathroom innovation. Okay, so, and, and, and poor clients, to a certain extent, is, is you come into this project, you, you design it, to the hills, you render it in ways that they cannot understand. You uh, you explain them the reasons behind all of this. You take their desires uh, two steps beyond what they were even imagining. You know, they want some light in the bathroom. Um, you take them outside of the bathroom. You have drawings and elevations and details far beyond anything that's necessary. Everything's custom. Everything is, is fabricated. Uh, everything is uh, uh, perhaps slightly outside of code. <laughs> um, you know, so we created a, a, you know, an outdoor shower uh, as a sort of crowning element to this project. And as Chris was saying, you know, in, in, in many projects you'll get, especially on the small scale, after an experience of dealing with high plus projects, is to where do you find the project in the project? Where can you find what it is that you want to, you know, design and, and really lean into? And, you know, for us, it was developing this, this transition from inside to outside. How do you plumb something that's outside? Um, not legally. Um, in the end, uh, the clients are still my friends. Um, they still send me pictures of their kids uh, enjoying the outdoor shower. Uh, but then you, you move on from, from your initial projects, which may be literally friends, to uh, friends of the friends which is a significant step because now your, your, your client is someone that you may or may not know but they've been, they've been you know, told they can trust you. So the first project that we came about was a, was a house in that, this is around 2010, 2011, the first real commission that we had beyond uh, renovation. You know, small cottage, those of you who are uh, familiar with that, it's a very, Tricky site. I think this is where we're looking at. I guess for me, is that how do I take my idea about what I think is interesting in architecture and take it from complex grand scales into small scales? And thankfully, Los Angeles is full of those those moments, whether it be uh, very tight, restrictive uh, locations like Venice, uh, to the hillsides and the organs and the coves and things that, that you know, God how we're able to design. Um, you might start with a client sketch, uh, or not. This one ends up being quite uh, predictive of where we ended up. Uh, so we spent a lot of time, we again, a lot of energy, a lot of effort into, into uh, designing something that we felt was, a, even though it was an addition, it was a very significant addition, it was uh, something we could be proud of. And, developed it to a level of detail that it wasn't really necessary for the, for the time. But in the end, it is it's something, even though now it's, it's quite old, we're, we're very happy with. And, and moving from that kind of work, and, and I think also just to, to, to reiterate what my goals are here so I don't lose myself, because I, is, is what I want to show is that when you, when you, when you leave school and you move through your profession, you're probably most likely going to work for someone for a while because and, and your education continues and it, and it will throughout your career. But working for people will, will also advance up to your thinking about what you want to do. And then when you're off working on your own, it's like, what opportunities are going to come your way and how can you resolve those with what the kind of work that you want to do. And, and another type of client that we have here is, is, is some of a friend of a, of a friend of a friend and doing a, a commercial development project which wanted to be a prototype cottage uh, to be uh, spread out over a large piece of land. Uh, this is pre-Airbnb but essentially the same ideas. So we went in and again, in good faith, uh, really wanted to do something interesting. Uh, in the end, unfortunately, the client like the design, wanted to own the design, didn't want to pay for the design, uh, which made it difficult for us to continue. Um, but in the end, again, because you're trying to find a project in the project, we ended up developing two prototypes uh, 
you know, not fully, and it shows once in a while. Now, work begins work is now, you know, after a couple projects, you start to have people have friends, they talk to friends, you start to have a little bit of a presence, and, and work starts coming to you. Um, we also, I will say, working on the, the Vista Playtest, we had the opportunity of working with uh, a prefab structural designer, uh, structural company called Blue Sky Building Systems. And Blue Sky Building Systems is uh, taking a moment, steel uh, fabricated moment frames that are used predominantly uh, as mezzanines and factories and trying to apply them to housing and construction. And they brought us on, again, because you're taking whatever work you can get, to help the designer put together their design guidelines for to distribute to clients and architects to how to use their system. So we took that to heart, and in the, the house that we did in Venice, which was three stories, we leveraged their system to the limit. Um, and I'll have a little bit more on that later. But from there, involvement with them, we started to get inquiries for work uh, from people who are interested in their system. Um, this is an example of a project that it's still a real project. Um, timelines in, in, uh, in Los Angeles can be rather long, especially when you're dealing with very difficult hillside sites. But um, most, of, like most of the work we do is uh, with people who have enough money that they want to do something interesting, but with budgets that are constricted. So again, feeding into my desire to have to deal with you know, difficulties and, and, and uh, complexities, this project was one dealing with the, the geotechnical issues, dealing with the topographic issues, dealing with the fact that it lies on the border of, of uh, the county uh, and Pasadena, dealing with different entities for various aspects of, of, of how you move forward. Um, this one is very close to being permitted, and you know, hopefully we'll be under construction soon. Uh, what I have, and I'm going to move somewhat quickly through these, uh, is a series of projects that sort of like the graveyard of projects. In the sense that we have clients who've come, you've designed, if perhaps for free, uh, in hopes of getting work. And this is a, you know, a type of client that, and a type of project that is, is all too common. Um, the Carver Field Hats, we were working with a nonprofit called the Concerned Citizens of South Central Los Angeles, who uh, do a lot of uh, projects for housing um, and are now dealing with doing sports fields around the city. Uh, we came in to help them design bleacher. Uh, it took four years. Uh, for reasons I, I'm not going to go into, it, but it's uh, still a hopeful project that you know perhaps we do get the field as that we were pursuing. Which um, we we'll have developer projects. Um, we've worked with many uh, developers working on uh, establishing either some kind of subdivision or uh, multi-unit, multi we're looking for uh, help. And we provide that help, both on the design side and both on the code side. So in something like this, we designed many houses, uh, designed an idea for how these houses worked, um, did the subdivision plan, uh, and unfortunately, like many of these projects, didn't really go anywhere. Uh, I want to see your height, it's very similar, different client, doing feasibility, uh, creating uh, a real scenario that they can present to the city, present to the ship, the stakeholders, present to the public, to try and find a way to, to you know, move it forward. Uh, you'll start doing projects that are just out of your head. You'll start doing things that uh, you, know, you have an idea about, you develop it into a, a somewhat real project with the hope of using it to develop interest with uh, potential clients, etc. You'll start working out of state, perhaps. Um, getting your license in another state, uh, opening uh, friends of friends opportunities, perhaps. Uh, this was a project that uh, we're doing in New York, which again is uh, a real project and it's happening hopefully soon, um, to do a cottage in upstate New York. Uh, the project in Hollywood Hills, uh, something that happens in Los Angeles a lot, and it's happening more now with the change in the ordinances to allow uh, accessory dwelling units. When people try to add on to their houses, the cost of building new is prohibitive. Um, 
augmenting your ads, you know, working with clients to, you know, rework their houses such that they are, uh, they function better and, you know, adding space to them as well. Sometimes you'll meet a very interesting client um, who doesn't really know what they want to do, but is willing to, you know, feed you and entertain uh, explorations of what could happen. Uh, this was a property in Pasadena. Um, the house was actually built by a steel company, and it's uh, can't see it here, but it's all steel. And this this client wanted to explore ways to expand his house and uh, accommodate his extended family. And unfortunately, once again, that one didn't go anywhere. Um, sometimes there's budget issues. What I've come to learn uh, after many client interactions is there's a, a feeling among many clients that if they tell you they only have $100, you'll only spend $100, but they'll still get what they want. Um, what really happens is you design a house for $100, they see it, they go, that's totally not what I want, I really want it to be $400, and they'll sometimes you know, shake the couch and then $400 are there. So this kind of strategy uh, is very frustrating and can end up uh, ending the relationship, which this one did, although I'm still in communication on another project with the client, but unfortunately his house didn't go anywhere because he wanted to do it for nowhere near where it was possible. Um, and in the Los Angeles, you also uh, start to skirt the fringes of the uh, building industry that caters to the highest end and the celebrity side. Sometimes this will be through brokers and, and real estate um, looking to add value to pieces of land. Um, it can be a fun exercise, um, but often doesn't lead anywhere. And again, when you're building your firm, you're, you're trying to find work, you're going to spend a lot of time trying to find the project in the process as I mentioned before. Um, you'll have clients that have, you know, they want, and, and you have to be careful not to, you know, lead them to something they can't have, but, you know, it's irresistible sometimes. You know, working on addition projects for houses where people are looking to, you know, stay tight and, uh, in their location but build a new house and, and add on to their addition one, uh, their existing one, in order to save money, can lead to uh, interesting design work, but uh, risky in the sense of whether it be executed or not. This one was executed, but only internally. I think the kitchen was realized to a certain extent. But unfortunately, the addition did not come back. Um, did some New York work for a client, actually was executed. I only have the design drawings here. Um, because again, it was executed on a, on a reduced uh, scope. But we had the opportunity to work on a, a penthouse project. Uh, we were combining two units on the top floor, and in addition to the two units on the top floor, there was uh, a dedicated roof deck. So we looked at, you know, how can we connect the two? How can we pass through the deck and create, you know, volume and space? Um, so we spent a lot of time doing the views and, and what could be done and how we could create uh, an access to the, to the roof from the interior that could be seen as an amenity. In the end, it ended up more like this. Now, coming, coming out of uh, working for someone like Tom May and working on projects that, that we had the opportunity to work on, you're in a constant state of, of trying to jump scale, at least I am. So, you know, houses are enjoyable because, again, as, as Chris mentioned before, the, the complexity and, and the design effort exists at any scale. You can, you can find what you're looking for in detail all the way up to, you know, urban master plans. But, you know, functioning as an office and wanting to, you know, grow, you also see you need to start chasing bigger contracts. So, you'll bend over backwards for certain projects if it's only outside of the realm of the, of the projects that you're working on now. Uh, in this case, uh, a very valuable piece of real estate in incredible disrepair, uh, homeowners association full of people, 
I mean, you know, probably should be institutionalized, uh, and trying to guide them to a rational decision of what to do with their property. Unfortunately, in the end, uh, it was a stalemate between 4D and, and 6D, and nothing came of this. But it got us into the orbit of a, a number of, of people, whether they be uh, consultants, contractors, or clients who, who deal in a different scale. Uh, so that, that happened, and, you know, but we, we still weren't, we weren't there yet. So another type of client that you'll come across is someone who has perhaps more time and money. I'm not going to say sense because I like this client, he's a very good person. Um, but we had a lot of fun with this project, and it was the pursuit of, of something that was unbuildable, because ultimately in the end, it was decided that what he wanted was nothing. Um, but it took us about six months to prove that out. Uh, he was also a very uh, collaborative client, <laughs> and uh, in a good way, if you have the energy for it. Um, but we had, this is one fifty. We, he, was, he was very prolific. So this project was uh, an addition to a house that he actually built only a number of years before uh, to add on what, unfortunately, the architect who, uh, I don't know if it was an architect who designed the house before, neglected to have any sort of uh, living space. So he wanted to create not only a living space that was attached to what he had already, but he, he wanted a bond layer. And it, it was, but it couldn't be there, in the sense that it couldn't block views. It, it had to feel like it wasn't there, but it really was there. Um, you can see, we looked at, and these are all you know, fairly detailed, but still conceptual, uh, lots of glass. Um, we had a, a continuation of the existing um, Mediterranean Spanish style house uh, with sunken, tech-laden, living room. Now, as I mentioned before, in Los Angeles you will uh, touch upon a whole different ecosystem. You know, if you're lucky or unlucky, depending on how you look at it, in the city of, of, of the, the multi-million dollar houses. And, and nowadays it's, it's the multi-multi-million dollar houses. And we had the opportunity to, to work on one for a while, confidential client, unfortunately, but dealt with the contractors who work in this in this realm, uh, the interior designers, uh, even the engineering and the consultants, and it's just a whole different world. Um, very interesting, still not convinced it's something I, I want to do, but it, it allowed us to work even though it's a single family house, it allows us to work on, on scales and complexity that was starting to be similar to what we dealt with in Morrison's, in the sense that it was an unbuildable site, in inaccessible location, uh, with unreasonable desire for scope and, and program. And we worked tirelessly for months, half a year, uh, fairly intensely, to solve all these problems within the very, very tricky and, and specific codes of Los Angeles. Uh, unfortunately, in the end, as things do, I think, more often in this, this ecosystem, there was a, a whimsical change of heart and, uh, and a very quick shift in direction. Now, I think starting to get clients who are coming to you for you as opposed to coming to you through connections, uh, friendly or otherwise. And usually you're hoping that they can pre-screen, and pre-screen either through use of your website or they Google you or they, they know what kind of work you do. Um, sometimes that's not the case. Uh, sometimes there's a, a lot of um, education that goes on um, if you were going to work together. And there's this story I won't go into detail on it, but at Morphosis doing the, the courthouse, and the, the judge who was the deciding uh, client for the courthouse that uh, in Eugene, Oregon, uh, federal courthouse that Morphosis did, uh, wanted a very traditional courthouse in a you know, capital building, dome, 
And it, it took a lot of uh, negotiation, I'm not sure, I don't have a picture of it, but uh, for Tom to get him on side, and in the end he was, and he was a proponent of the design that just came up with. Um, these clients are very traditional, and I, and I feel like we spent a long time you know, catering to their desires in, in terms of privacy, the plan, and, and dividing up, you know, separating parts of their lives, um, and adhering to their desire for single-story house, adhering to their desire for no flat roof, and, and ending up with what ended up, you know, a fairly interesting, uh, complex roof geometry uh, house. And this also was a point that you hope to get to sooner than later, and that Q is telling me no one's going to notice the difference here, but this one is a rendering. This one is a finished house. So we finally actually got into construction and we started getting our stuff built. And, and part of it is not so much that you reach a point that it starts happening, but everything's a long road. And, and I think when you, if you think about starting your own practice, from finding the clients, going through the design process, getting things approved, getting to start your construction, you're going through many years before anything takes form. So there'll be a point in your, your, your uh, own career where things start happening. So all of a sudden, we were on the site, we were digging holes, we were building stuff. And we were trying to do stuff that, you know, at a residential scale was, was as difficult as possible. Uh, the video on the left, the one on the right doesn't seem to be working, let me try that. We, in Santa Monica, hoisted a 60-foot steel beam into position. It's a GoPro on the one on the right. Uh, the one left is obviously uh, watching it go. And, you know, for us, this was, uh, and actually, the guys are here, let's see the video on the right, uh, was kind of a big moment. We're doing a single story house in, in Los Angeles, and, and we're flying in tons of steel with, a, with an 80 foot crane. And what was amazing about that is that even though, I mean, it, we felt it was kind of a big deal. The neighbors thought it was really a big deal. <laughs> uh, but in, in the end, you know, it, it's, it's, it's still single family house. But I think we were starting to find uh, what we were looking for in, in, in building. Um, a side story for this, which is funny if you're not him. Uh, once the beam was in, they started loading it. We noticed that it was deflecting too much. Uh, came to a debate about whether or not they came with the beam or not. Um, they said they did. Uh, I said there was no way. We took measurements, and the funny thing about steel is it's predictable uh, with physics and engineering. So we proved them out. So he'd come back with the crane, load it back in the truck, <laughs> drive it back in the shop, camber it, bring it back, swing it in the crane. So you know we had a, we had a GoPro on this thing. But, you know, in the end, did it three times, so. Uh, so, I was a framing carpenter before I was an architect, and, you know, we had fun with this one. You know, in addition to this steel, we have, uh, you know, 40-foot long valley rafters, and uh, glue lamps here and there, uh, extended cantilevered uh, ridge beams to carry these brows that uh, protect the glass from the sun. Uh, created the, you know, the, the wide open, clear span um, family rooms for the kitchen. You know, the construction. Managed to wrestle most of the details to a reasonable state. And again, ended up with a finished house. In a way, it looks a lot like the renderings that we did. It's very freshly done, and these are our photos. So you get to a point where you get one. I mean, other than the small renovations. So now we move on. Now projects are happening, and they're getting into construction. This is a project in Echo Park. Uh, it's in a, an R2 zoning, 
which allows us to, to build multi-unit. So we chose to do two, two units, two houses, um, in a coach house, main house scenario, parking at another one's because you know, we're still forced to put in four parking spaces. Uh, but you know, the idea is working with, okay, what are, you know, what, what are the complexities inherent in a project like this? And this is dealing with privacy, this is dealing with views, this is dealing with you know, managing the space and, and creating outdoor spaces that are both you know, community and private at the same time. Uh, and it was all centered around uh, a tree. Uh, we had an existing tree on, on the site, which in the end was, uh, un was not viable. And then we remove it, but we were replacing it in the same location. And, and the idea is the design surrounds this tree, which provides privacy from the different units, the two units, anyways, and, and manages their views. Now, because we're on a roll, this one's happening too. And this is a development project, which is very different than the other one. The other project is, is, a, is dealing with the client and, and hand-holding the client and helping them through the pain that is building a house. Developer is, in some ways, more difficult, in other ways, uh, a lot easier. You are dealing with uh, money issues up front, but if you have the right client, the right developer client, you realize the value in design, so I'm doing it. And I'm looking for a way to, to you know, to figure out a way to, to measure that. But we're, uh, we're well on design. This is going to be done probably first quarter of 2018. And, and brings with it, you know, a lot of the ideas, I think, that, are, that came about at Morphosis, and, and even though on a much smaller scale. Now, back to my VAB project is, you know, these things live and they carry on for many, many years. And, hey, this one's happening now too. So, this one being very different, you can see the video on the left, is it was a fully steel structure. Uh, this was the Blue Sky Building Systems. And then it's being difficult at the best of times to, to, to construct in. We rolled up an 18-wheeler uh, loaded with steel, uh, rolled it down the alley, and with a crane started plopping nine 35-foot columns behind a little cottage. And the frame went up in a couple days. And we actually built up the curtain wall, which is unusual for a house, uh, mainly because of the way the steel behaves seismically, we have to, uh, everything is on slip joints, including the interior partition walls, which is exciting. Uh, the interior space is, is, is built around an atrium, uh, which joins all the public spaces in the house, and you can make it out just through the bones right now. And this, Again, we're opening the first quarter of 2018. Now, I've got a few minutes left, but now we're working with a developer. Now things are opening up. We're starting to have access to you know, potential shipping projects. So we started looking at commercial spaces, creative office, you know, rehab of, of, of existing structures, um, you know, interior office design. And, and meeting the type of clients who have access to work that we want to get to. So we're working pretty hard to get their attention. We're doing feasibility and concept studies that, for the most part, are almost available in terms of their detail and, uh, and drawing development. And trying to you know, use our explorations to convince people to trust us with projects that we don't have a track record in, at least in, in my solo career. And, and eventually, you get lucky. So we have a project now that is real. It's uh, almost permitted. Um, you can see it here, right? 
Uh, and it's a, it's a project similar to you know type that's you know happening a lot in Los Angeles these days with the housing shortage, um, the new transit-oriented uh, development rules that are allowing for an increased density along along major arteries in Los Angeles. And what we've done is we've tried to do uh, a migrated project. Granted, it's Los Angeles style, so it's like migrated unit plus. The units are a little bigger. But the idea is, is density, the idea is getting away from cars, and, and trying to do something you know, a little bit different. Uh, we have these kind of down here. You can see, uh, if one, you know, roll up doors, uh, pretty raw, pretty industrial loft space, um, concrete floors, trying to do them sort of as a bulletproof space for young professionals. And we see that that scale now, we're hoping we'll catch, we're looking, you know, we're involved in negotiations on a number of projects at that level, and, and hopefully we can translate that into, into more of the same kind of work. Um, just as a side note, just to wrap things up a little bit, we're also working uh, a little bit, what we like to do is maybe the tech space, but it's really still bricks and mortar. We're working with a, with a company called Havelli, who is looking to uh, revolutionize uh, mobile retail, and we're helping them in their early venture capitalist uh, 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 meetings. We're serving as their uh, architectural consultants. And just to, to wrap up, I wanted to look at our studio. Um, it's also a project ongoing. We're building it out, and uh, here are my guys, Ryan Dag. Uh, Ellen Mercado, Jerry Lanto. Um, all the work we saw tonight is, is uh, I have to thank these guys because they you know, help me out in a big way every day. Um, I guess I got to the end faster than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs>